My name is Suraj Shetty, and I'm a senior solutions architect here at MongoDB. I'm going to briefly talk about MongoDB Atlas, which is a cloud-based database as a service offering, which is available to be run on top of AWS. I'm going to cover a few topics. Firstly, the why now, which discusses the current technology climate, and then delve deeper into the fundamental concepts of NoSQL and the document model itself, as well as the MongoDB architecture itself. With social distancing in place, companies are doubling down on online experiences, with many moving to an online-first approach. Likewise, consumers are relying on online services now more than ever. Whether it's education, healthcare, groceries, and even entertainment, our lives revolve around our screens in unprecedented ways. Having access to up-to-date, relevant, and accurate information is crucial for companies, and frankly, it's expected by consumers. Additionally, with so much uncertainty in the market, many companies are not actively growing their workforce, so teams are being asked to accomplish more with fewer resources. That's where MongoDB can help. With MongoDB Atlas helping companies save time, valuable staff resources, and especially money. Running in a cloud environment obviously has many advantages, such as elasticity and cheaper costs, as well as easier integration opportunities. However, MongoDB Atlas and AWS have a long history together. Most of our initial integration development is done with AWS first. We feel that AWS is the most mature and stable cloud platform, and thus we do most of our initial development against AWS. Some of the new features that we have developed in AWS first are our data lake offering, where we can take an S3 bucket and fill it with JSON or CSV files and basically treat it as a MongoDB data source. This provides a big help to our customers as they can now offload infrequently accessed data to S3 and thus reduce the overall data set in their cluster, saving them money and improving performance. Also, our newest database access controls, where we now allow database users to be tied directly to an IAM user or IAM role, greatly simplify database user management. These are just a few of the unique to AWS features we have recently rolled out. Now a little history on MongoDB itself. MongoDB was born in the open source community. It was created by developers for developers. As a result of this, MongoDB is wildly popular and almost everyone has had some experience using a MongoDB database. The experience that most people have with Mongo has been downloading it and running it locally for a small proof of concept development effort. But little do most people know that as of 2017, MongoDB is a publicly traded company that continues to grow and expand and improve the database, not to mention create more and more services such as Atlas. So the big takeaway is that MongoDB is a multi-purpose database. MongoDB is also evolving fast. Going back to 2016, every release has enriched functionality across the core database, as well as Atlas's fully managed services and tools. This has enabled developers to serve an ever greater range of use cases, and 4.4 packs even more in it than before. Our product team is quite attuned to customer needs, and thus some of the most asked for features end up being prioritized and released such as union aggregations, where we can now join multiple collections and treat them as a single collection for aggregations, or auto-scaling in Atlas, where a cluster will automatically scale up after heavy usage within a given time frame. And so this is just showing the rate of acceleration at which Mongo is creating features. Mongo has also now switched to a rapid release model, where quarterly releases will now be available in our Atlas environment. Obviously, being fully managed and controlled by us allows us to now release upgrades and fixes in this accelerated manner. In the past, upgrading was done infrequently and sometimes with difficulty, but now being fully deployed on AWS allows us to automate everything, including more frequent updates. And now I just wanted to cover some basic terminology before we continue. So as I said before, MongoDB is a multi-purpose database, but due to the structural differences, some pieces are not quite the same as in a relational database. For instance, instead of tables, MongoDB contains collections. Instead of rows, each collection contains documents. This illustrates how instead of a flat table with rows, MongoDB instead consists of collections of multi-dimensional documents. And here is how a normal application is structured today. On the top, what you see is your, your complex objects, such as customers. And the application is using these objects 
which then have to get translated by an object relational mapping layer. This data then gets normalized and put into the respective tables. So this is what people are used to these days. And what MongoDB developers said, well, why do we have to do this? What we want to do is store the data just as you're using it in your application. That's how we want to store it in the database itself. So we want to go from this to this. And you can see what this does is it greatly simplifies the process, first of all. No, no more need for a DBA to be managing all the complex relationships, not to mention improved speed and performance. Because now I no longer need to do any joins when I'm actually accessing the data or writing the data. So again, this just keeps everything nice and simple and allows this to scale. Because at the end, that is what this is about. So here is a comparison where you see on the left is a relational model, and on the right, JSON document, which is Mongo, Mongo model. So on the left, what you have is a customer object where you have a customer which can have more than one address. An address can have one or many phone numbers. And you can see how this now distributes all those relations. Well, what that ends up doing, though, is creating seven different tables that I have to now join or write to whenever I want to make a change. So what MongoDB said was, well, why don't we just store that as a JSON? And you can see we still have completely the same flexibility. So for instance, with the, uh, with the addresses, we can have that in an array so that we can still store any number of them in that array. So this still gives us all of that flexibility without giving us the rigid structures or the distribution of the data. And you can see how this naturally does map to how the object is actually being used in code, seeing as this is really what the application ends up wanting anyway. But then another advantage is you are not actually dealing with this JSON in, 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 your, in your application. What you're actually getting back is binary JSON, or that's how it's stored. So you're actually getting back the actual typed objects. It can be strongly typed, such, such that you do get actual numbers back and dates and whatnot. So this allows you to do a lot more. Not to mention, because it's a JSON document, it's now flexible. So even though the documents are all in one collection, those documents don't have to be the same. They can be completely heterogeneous. So for instance, in this example here, you can see how one record can contain the phone object, but another one doesn't even have to have it all at all. So what this also does is allows us to save a lot of space, not to mention be completely flexible. If you have new data that, decided to, that you decided to import in right now that had completely new fields, that's perfectly acceptable and everything would work smoothly. Because really now, it's up to the application layer to determine what I should be doing with this object and what data should or should not be there. But that being said, people, you know, they get a little scared when you say, okay, you can put anything in. There is the old adage of garbage in, garbage out. So which is why MongoDB is tunable. We can add structure if we need to. And this structure can be enforced such that, uh, for example, every record has to have an email address, and that email address has to be a string. So we can enforce these things with a rigid schema if it's absolutely necessary. Again, with the caveat that if that, if that rigid structure is in place, future changes become a little bit more difficult. And with all of this, we have all of our drivers and frameworks. Again, being born out of the open source community, you are not dealing with JSON and having strings going back and forth to, to, the, to the database. We have idiomatic drivers that actually give you back the objects in your native format. For example, like with the Java driver, you will actually get back a map object with all of the corresponding pieces. So never are you doing any kind of marshalling or translation or anything with the strings themselves. You are simply working with the objects. And that works both ways. So when I want to save data to the database, again, I just take that object and put it in through my driver, and, and the drivers take care of the rest, and everything is persisted nicely in the database. Uh, something that is relatively new to, to Mongo is ACID transactions. So what we had before is, as I said, you can split data amongst collections, even related records, thus creating the concept of a join that is perfectly allowed. And so now with that, we now have uh, multi-document ACID transactions. And it works exactly the same as with the relational model, where you simply open the transaction, perform all of your updates, and then commit the transaction. And in much the same way as, as previously, nothing will actually get changed in the database until that commit occurs. That way, anything that happens to break or, or error out during the transaction, it can easily be rolled back, or rather, rather it's not even committed in the first place. 
And with this document model, you still have complete versatility. So even though I have a complex JSON where I have nested objects inside of them, every single one of those fields is still indexable and searchable. So this is very important in that the indexes are actually stored independent of the data. So the consequence of that is I can really create and destroy indexes anytime I want with no impact to the actual database. Uh, because it can even be built up in a rolling fashion after the fact, if I decide I wanted to create a new index, that can be done really at any time with little to no impact. As well, I can create compound indexes that take multiple fields into account. Even if those uh, objects or fields are inside of an array, all of that is fair game as the index is basically an independent entity that allows you to quickly traverse the data set. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Mongo's architecture. And because of its architecture, there's a lot of byproducts as a result. One of them is that it's highly available. So the normal strategy is you have a primary node and two secondary nodes. And what's happening is the secondary nodes are basically just tailing the oplog of the primary and replaying the events. Thus they are staying in sync. Well, one of the byproducts is you now have a replica that is readily available, such that if a primary node fails or goes down for any reason, a, an election is held and a secondary will take over as the new primary. And this is done seamlessly without anyone noticing on the front end. And then what happens is, as the primary does come back online, it will come back online as a secondary and simply catch up by now tailing the new primary. All of this is seamless and automatic and is a complete byproduct of the architecture. And then as a result of that, we can do a lot of interesting things now with these secondary nodes, one of which is workload isolation. So now instead of having just two secondary nodes, what if I added a fourth node, which will now actually be tailing the primary just as, as a secondary, just as the other ones are, but now that node is gonna be used exclusively for analytics, for instance. So now I can run complex aggregations and computations on this node without impacting my primary. Even if the node gets taxed and is too busy and even can't keep up with the primary, that's fine because it's gonna run my processes and then when it can, it's gonna go and catch up with the primary. So this allows you to now isolate a lot of your workloads without impacting your primary database. As well, this allows you to scale. So now instead of having simply two secondary nodes, maybe I decide to have six secondary nodes. What I can now do, as long as you don't mind being a slightly eventually consistent, and I mean on the order of milliseconds or seconds eventually, you can now send a lot of your reads to these secondary nodes. As a result, your primary is now free to do a lot more processing and ingestion. So this allows you to scale just within the cluster as well as sharding, which I'm gonna get into in a little bit. And then with these nodes, now that I have these secondary nodes, I can really put them wherever I want. So for instance, if I decided that I want to put a secondary node in Dublin, Ireland, because that's where my analytics team resides, well now, even though it's tailing by just a, a few milliseconds from the primary, they can basically have real-time data with low latency to their location, so they're free to run complex aggregations. As well, this also addresses certain other issues of locality, such as EU data having to reside within the EU. Again, we can do that very, very easily because of the nature of our architecture. And here's just a basic primer on the architecture. So like I said, you have a primary node with two secondary nodes. This is our basic architecture. Obviously, you can have n number of secondary nodes after that. But really, this is the key to allowing us all of those previously mentioned functions and features. And so we can do a lot more interesting things with the secondary nodes, such as we now have what's called a BI, uh, BI collector. And what that does is it actually creates another secondary node. And what that does is then it actually unwinds the JSON documents. So you remember how we had this complex JSON document that was in there? Well, this actually unwinds it and creates virtual tables. This then allows other tools such as Tableau to now actually speak SQL, even though it's being done virtually. And again, it is only a few milliseconds to seconds behind the primary because this node is simply tailing the oplog as well. So no more, there's no more need for data warehousing or daily dumps. You can basically have on demand, almost real time data for your analytics. And again, simply as a byproduct of the architecture. 
And now I'm going to talk about sharding a little bit. So usually when you have a database, if you want to scale, all you can really do is get a bigger vertical instance, which of course comes with certain costs. The cost curve is actually an exponential cost curve. It's not a linear cost curve versus if you're sharding. And what sharding is, uh, the, the example I like to give is like a phone book. So I wouldn't simply have every single person's phone number in one database that I have to traverse every single person every single time. What I would do, just like a phone book does, is I would put the first letter of their last name. So for example, shard one would be A, shard two would be B. So now if I'm searching someone or even updating someone whose last name starts with B, I would simply go right to shard two and I simply have to manage in that subset. And in this way, you can actually distribute your database across any specific key that you want to make it very easy to scale horizontally. And this really now turns your, your, your curve into a linear curve because simply adding a new shard every single time and growing your set that way, it's not going to be a vertical increase, it's a horizontal increase. So it allows you to actually scale relatively cheaply. And so when you want to scale beyond a single node, in the past that has been very difficult. Uh, a lot of it's done manually. Now with MongoDB Atlas, we have auto sharding. So you simply choose the key, you choose the number of shards, and it takes care of everything. It's taking care of the routing, it's taking care of, of any updates. So all of this is completely transparent to the, to the, end, to the end user. Uh, and for, the, for us as developers, it makes our lives very, very much easy. And then the last thing I like to cover is that Mongo is the same wherever it's run. The beauty of Mongo is you can run it anywhere. So I could take a laptop and download Mongo and run it locally and develop an application against it. And then maybe in a few hours I decide, well, you know, this is now ready for, for, for a little bit more distribution and I can move that database into a, into a mainframe or into a server. And then I can say, you know what, now that this is growing even bigger, I want to put it onto some EC2 instances that are, that are managed by me. Or I can even take it and put it right into Atlas, where it is, it is completely managed by us. All you have to change in your code is where you're pointing your string. All other code, aggregation code, any kind of operations, all of those are identical with nothing else being changed whatsoever. So this also makes it very nice for migration plays, where now if I decide, well, I'm running on Google right now and they're not quite up to snuff and I want to move everything to AWS with our live migration in Atlas, very easy. We actually start copying all of the data for you. That data is being kept in sync. And now all you have to do is when a quorum of data has been copied over, you simply repoint your servers to the new instances and you're up and running. Very seamless and very painless. So that are some, that's some of the big advantages of using Mongo. And that concludes my talk for today. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day.